Following up on the concept of comparing proportions, we've looked at one proportion compared to a claim. We've compared two different proportions to each other, but we've not dealt with a situation where we've compared multiple proportions, meaning three or more at the same time. We're gonna do so with less than 10 here when we look at chi-squared goodness of fit. This is used for analyzing counts or proportions for multiple groups. We'll see that this covers a lot of the same material that your first exam covered. Um, and a lot of this material can actually be used to redo material from the first exam. So if you go back with this new model, you might be able to see another way of approaching some problems that previously were a bit challenging, perhaps using pooling, for example. So let's just start with a uh, problem here and see how this goes. Um, suppose I'm given a six-sided die and I'm told that it's fair. And I'm not convinced that it's fair because when I'm looking at this, I get six showing up 15 times, one showing up nine times. That doesn't seem like that should happen on a fair die. That's way too many sixes. So um, what I would like you to pause and try to do on your own before I do it with you, uh, if the die is actually fair, what proportion of time should I get a one? So what percentage of the time should one show up? As a fraction, what is that? Now, let's suppose that in total, I rolled the die 66 times. How many times should I get a one out of those 66 times? And do that for the two, the three, the four, and so on. So try to figure out how often should each of these things show up. So I might label this first row here as observed. This is what's happened to me. Second row here, I might label as the expected. This is what I was anticipating to get if the thing was actually fair, whatever that number ends up being. I don't know what that number is off the top of my head. Next thing I want you to do is figure out how far each of these things are away from it being fair. So for example, if the number ends up being like 10, well, one is, uh, nine is one away from 10. If this was 11, I would be two away from uh, the expected value there. So figure out what I expect and then how far off from the expected. Next thing, try to write that amount that you're off by as a percentage. So for example, maybe you're off by two out of you were expecting 11. What's that as a percent? And finally, if I want to determine if it's fair, does this read more like a question about hypothesis test or confidence interval? Go ahead and pause the video and give this a go. See what you get for this first page on chi-square. I'm gonna do some of this with you. If a die is actually fair, well, Fair means that I should get a one, two, all the way up to a six. All of these things should be equally likely and they should all show up one sixth of the time. So if I'm trying to figure out how much I expect to get for each of these things, well, I expect one sixth of that total. When I added up all of these numbers, I ended up seeing that this was for 66 rolls. One six of 66 for each of the categories. And one six of 66, I believe is 11. Now here's another way to get this. I'm gonna take the total number of trials and I'm gonna multiply it by the probability of success. If this looks familiar, I'm doing N times P to come up with my number of successes. This is the same way that I've checked my assumptions in the past. So I have 66 times 1, 6. I expect 11 for each of these categories. Now, as you can see, I had some error. So for the second part, to figure out the error, I'm going to take the amount that I saw and subtract the amount that I was expecting. So I'll just add another row to this ever-growing table. Observe minus expected. 
I got nine, I was expecting 11. Nine minus 11 tells me I am off by two, a negative two in this case, because I'm down. 13 minus 11, this is off by a positive two. Those errors look like they'll cancel each other out. Nine minus 11, I'm at negative two. 12 minus 11 is one. Eight minus 11 is negative three. Trying to line these things up still. And finally, I have 15 minus 11. This is where I appear to have the most air coming in at four. Now, if I was predicting the value to be 200 and I got 199, I'd feel pretty good about that. I'm only off by one. However, if I was expecting two when I got one, I would feel less good about that because I would be off by one. Now, if you're thinking, well, hold up, you just said there's one error for both of those. Why is one worse than another? Well, one out of 200 is a really minimal amount of error, while one out of two is a considerable amount of error, that's 50%. So it's not enough to just say I'm off by two. I wanna know compared to this 11, what sort of percent am I dealing with? So to come up with this percent, in some sense, this is almost like a, a relative percentage. I'm gonna figure out how far I was off by observed minus the expected. And I'm gonna divide this by the amount that I was expecting to get that error. For example, for the number of ones, my percentage of error, I noticed nine, I was expecting 11, and my error is relative to the 11. So my previous error, just as a number, was negative two. But when comparing that to the value that I was expecting to get 11, I end up getting an error of approximately negative 18.8 repeating percent. What I would like you to do, if you didn't get it before, pause the video, go back, and see if you can add another row to this ever-growing monstrous table. And our future tables are gonna be considerably smaller. This one's just big because we're trying to figure out what's what. And for this negative two, I had an error of negative 18% or so. Please add all of the percentages. I wanna see what my errors look like. Go ahead and pause the video. I'll give you some time to try it out. Here's what I got. And double check my math and to make sure I'm getting the right values. Negative 18, positive 18. This is a negative 18%. This appears to be a positive 9% of error. Off by 9% isn't the end of the world. Negative three, this is down by 27%. Yeesh, that's not great. Four, this has an error of 36%. That is a ridiculous amount of error for that last category up to a little bit of rounding. So if I'm wondering, is this fair or not fair? A reminder, hypothesis tests are always used to test claims about fairness. So if I wanna look at all these categories at once, it really feels like I have a null hypothesis of everything being fair. Fair meaning that all of the percentages are as claimed that these are all equal to one six, or it's not fair. And if it's not fair, then all it would take is one of these categories to be off. So for example, if I'm getting too many six, I would say, hey, that's not fair. So it would be not fair if at least one proportion out of the six is not one-sixth as claimed. 
So I just want to do a quick check-in to see where we're at for errors thus far. Um, let's add all of these numbers together to see what we're looking at for our total error. And this total error will kind of serve as our test statistic in some sense. Let's see what we get. I'm doing negative 18 plus 18 minus 18 plus 9 and so on. I'm just going to type this into a calculator. I feel like I might have done that wrong. I got 0%. That's really strange. Because there's clearly error going on in the problem. There's 36. There's the negative. Oh, there's the positive 36. There's the negative 27. When I'm combining these things, I'm noticing that my signs are causing these things to cancel out. So I might want to redo this idea of adding up my total error. So that way I don't end up getting 0%. Because right now I'm running into an issue where my signs are canceling each other out. So let's turn the page and kind of review what happened. So what I did so far, and I'm just going to doodle it here. I know there's a symbol. I'm just going to pretend the symbol's not here for a second. This means add. I added a whole bunch of things together. And I added my observed value minus the expected. Sometimes this gave me a positive and sometimes this gave me a negative. And I divided this by the expected. So I sort of added my percentages to figure out what was going on with my total error. When I did this, the positives and negatives canceled. So what happened? My positives and negatives canceled. So to fix this issue of the signs, I am going to try to square this number. So I'm only adding up positive things. By doing this, I invent a new distribution called chi-squared. This square reminding me that I need to square each of the entries as I go along. Just like uh, our previous t distribution, this chi-squared distribution has degrees of freedom as well. This should come as no surprise, but if I have k equals six categories, then my degree of freedom would be five. So much like the t distribution, my degrees of freedom here are going to be k minus 1. And for our dice, that's 5. So it's working exactly like the t distribution does for degrees of freedom. We're going to calculate this value in just a second to make sure that we're not getting 0. I'm going to give you the assumptions, and they should look really familiar. First assumption, random. By this, I mean no bias. Second assumption, I need to make sure my data, one trial does not affect another. The backup for that is the 10% rule. And finally, I need large n. Previously, I needed np to be greater than or equal to 10. But the nice thing about this distribution is I'm squaring things. So I can get by with considerably less. So just by having five, this is almost like it's acting like 25 if I square it. So I can get by with a lot less using this chi-squared model. Another way to phrase this is I need to make sure that I expect at least five in each of the categories. Going back to our dice, I expected 11 in each of the categories, so I'm in pretty good shape. To visualize what this thing uh, would be, it ends up having this nice sort of right skewness to it. We're going to calculate this chi-squared for our data, and then I'm going to put it on the graph to try to visualize this. I'm going to add up our observed values minus the expecteds over the expecteds, and I'm going to square it so I don't get zero. 
So my first value in my list, I had nine minus 11 over 11. This gave me negative 18%. To fix that negative problem, I'm gonna square the top. The next value in the list, 13 minus 11 squared. I don't wanna end up with a negative, so I'm gonna square it. It's already positive, but whatever I do, I have to be consistent. I'm just gonna keep going through. I'm gonna have nine minus 11 squared, 12 minus 11 squared, eight minus 11 squared, and 15 minus 11 squared. So keep going all the way to the last number in the list, 15 minus the expected squared over the expected. Pause the video and go ahead and calculate that and see what you get. And I'm gonna calculate that as well. Okay, if you're joining me again, when I type this into my calculator, I got 3.45 repeating or so. So my test statistic or my chi squared is 3.45. If this was a z-score, I would say, hey, that's a really, really large z-score. But unfortunately, I don't have a great frame of reference when it comes to chi squared, because I don't really know where that is on the curve. So let me help you with that. The smallest this can ever be because you're squaring it is zero. And it's going to be zero if and only if your observed values are remarkably close to your expected. It's only going to be zero if you end up with these two values being the same. This would represent something being perfectly fair, like Stepford uh, kind of fair, super creepy in line fair. To the extreme, if I have something really, really large, larger chi-squared values are going to be associated with things being unfair. The mound for this graph, if I'm trying to visualize where this happens, this mound is at the degree of freedom minus two. My degree of freedom for this dice problem was six, so my mound, oops, degree of freedom, six categories minus one degree of freedom, five. So my mound will happen at five minus two will happen at three. So this 3.45, that's showing up somewhere about there. Now this is supposed to be a hypothesis test. So there should be some sort of shading going on, but I don't know if I'm supposed to shade this thing to the left side or to the right side. I don't know how I'm supposed to find this thing inside of a, a table or a calculator, but at least I have a starting picture and I'm making some progress. So we're going to continue on to example two, where we're gonna do a lot of the same stuff again for the same data. I'm just really trying to drive home what the process is here. And then we're gonna answer that question about shading. So first thing I wanna fix is this is supposed to be a hypothesis test. So I should see the four step framework. First step, hypotheses. Second step, model and assumptions. Third step is going to be my p-value step. And my final step is going to be my conclusion. Let's start with the null and alternative hypotheses. We mentioned this before, but the null hypothesis represents something being fair or a good fit. And the alternative hypothesis represents it being not fair or not a good fit. 
that's where the name comes from. A goodness of fit is really saying, this is the distribution that we're being told, a fair distribution. If it's fair, then that distribution should look like probability of one equals probability of two all the way up to the probability of six, or that's equal to one six the whole way across. For alternative hypothesis, all it takes is one of those probabilities to be different for the whole thing to be considered unfair. So I don't care if the number of ones is okay if I'm getting way too many sixes. It's an all or nothing deal. For the model, when I'm comparing multiple counts, I'm going to add all of the observed values minus the expected over the expected. This gives me the percentage error, and I'm squaring that sort of percentage on the top there so I don't end up getting zero. And our expected, when we're talking about that, is going to be the total number of trials n multiplied by our probability p. And in our table previously, we had the expected was 11. We found this by taking our observed value of 9 minus 11 squared over 11 plus dot, 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 all the way up to the last value was 15 minus 11 squared over 11. And when I typed this into a calculator, I got 3.45 repeating. Finally, this distribution, much like a T distribution, it has a degree of freedom. That degree of freedom is the number of categories minus one. If I have six categories, my degree of freedom will end up being five. Assumptions. First assumption is I need to be able to count my data. And yes, I can clearly count if I roll a die, I can count how many times the one shows up. There's no problem with that. Now, if this is something like the weight of an object, I can't really count the weight in the same way. I might end up with like 1.26 ounces. That's not a one, two, three, four, five whole number kind of thing. I'm only working with whole number counts. Another way of saying this is I need to have categorical data here. I cannot have quantitative data. It needs to be either success or failure. Um, I also need to make sure that my data is random. And I would say yes here as well, because I'm looking at dice rolls and dice rolls are random. Rolling the die and having the die be fair are two different things. So I can roll the dice in such a way where there's no bias, even if that die ends up being an unfair die. Independence or less than 10%. I'm feeling pretty good about independence because I have one roll does not affect another, so independent rolls. And finally, large N, I need to expect five or more in each of my categories. And I expected 11 successes in each of those categories. That's bigger than five. I'm in great shape. So I've passed all four of my assumptions here. I can proceed to the next part of the problem. And the next part of the problem is the p-value. And this is where we left off on that last page. But I just wanted to make sure that I had this down in this language of a hypothesis test. So zero is the center. The mound is the degree of freedom minus two. Five minus two is giving us a mound of three. And my chi squared is coming in here at 3.45 repeating. Now, Assuming I had something in my calculator like a TCDF, but for chi squared, I might be able to calculate the chi squared value, draw a picture. I've kind of already done that. 
and then look it up on that calculator. And luckily, in the same spot where I do my second VARS, I see right underneath TCDF, chi-squared CDF is an option. And chi-squared CDF works the same way that TCDF does. Chi-squared CDF, you're going to type in the low value, the high value, and then the degree of freedom. So this is identical to how that TCDF worked. You'll have your low chi-squared number, your high uh, value, and then your degree of freedom. So assuming if I can figure out if this thing is shaded to the left or to the right, I'm going to be immediately done with this problem. I will type it into my calculator. It will give me my p-value. I will compare that p-value to a neutral alpha level of something like 5%. And I'll see if I reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So literally the only thing I am missing before everything comes together is this matter of shading to the left or to the right. So I'm going to come back to this page. And I'm going to really try to figure out which way to shade. Because this is the most fundamental question, the only thing I'm missing before I finish the problem. So let's flip the page over and try it out. So I'm going to look at a couple of different what if scenarios here, trying to figure out which way to shade the curve. First situation I'm going to consider is a die being perfectly fair. And let's try to think about what a perfectly fair die might look like. So first off, null hypothesis is fair. Alternative hypothesis is not fair. If it's perfectly fair, I'm hoping that I end up at this null hypothesis that I fail to reject the null. If it's fair, then what I see should be the same as what I expect. Now my chi-squared I get by doing the observed value minus the expected squared divided by the expected. Let's think about what this chi-squared would look like if it was perfectly fair. Well, I would have the same number here. So I'd have something like 3 minus 3. If I did 3 minus 3, this would give me 0. If I took 0 and I squared it, I still have 0. If I have 0 over a number, I still have 0. If I add up a whole bunch of zeros, well, I'm just going to get something ridiculously small. So the smallest your chi-squared could ever be is 0, and this is going to happen when it looks fair. So on my curve, a small chi-squared value should be close to the zero side of things. Now I'm going to try to figure out which way I should shade this curve in order to get the correct solution for my hypothesis test here. So in this problem, we said it was perfectly fair for this what-if scenario. And if it's perfectly fair, I should fail to reject that null hypothesis. If I'm failing to reject the null hypothesis, well, that only happens when I have a large p-value. And the only way I'm going to get a large p-value in this picture is if I shade to this right side, because if I shade to the left, it would be really, really small. So in the situation where the die is perfectly fair, I end up shading the curve to the right. So if it is fair, I shade right. Well, let's look at the opposite and see what's going on there. Let's consider the situation where the die is extremely unfair.
So in this situation, I would want to reject that null hypothesis. I would have evidence of it being unfair if it's just bonkers unfair. Assuming it's unfair, then my observed and my expected should be really different numbers. For example, I see zero successes, but I'm supposed to get a thousand. If I take that large of a difference and I square it, I'm going to have a really large amount of total error. And that's what the chi-squared measures. So on my curve here, this side represents fair. If it's unfair, I should see a really large chi-squared value. Thinking of this in terms of the hypothesis test, if it's unfair, I should reject the null hypothesis. So if I want to reject the null hypothesis, if the p-value is low, the null must go, I have to have a small p-value in order to reject that claim. Well, the only way I'm going to get a small p-value on this curve is if I shade this thing to the right side as well. So if it is unfair, I shade right. Let's think about what this means. If it's fair, I'm going to shade it to the right. If it's unfair, I'm going to shade it to the right. In fact, general observation, I always shade to the right. So when I'm setting up my chi-squared, this is always going to start at whatever the value is, comma, and it's going to keep going on towards infinity. And then whatever our degree of freedom is. So as a reminder, this is in the same spot where you found your TCDF. So if you're doing this on a TI-83 or an 84, you're going to go second vars, and you're going to find the thing that looks like chi-squared CDF, and it might spell it out as a word or it might have the symbol. If you're on a TI-89, you're going to go into your apps and then stat list editor. You'll choose F5 for distribution, and the option you'll want is chi-squared CDF. You'll type in your low value. Your low will be whatever your chi-squared is. Your high value, that's infinity. Whatever your degree of freedom is, number of categories minus one. So for our previous problem, we should do chi-squared CDF. Our picture will start at 3.45. It will go on forever in the right direction, infinity. And our degree of freedom was 5. Let's try typing it into a calculator and seeing what we get. I'm using my 84 only because out of all my calculators, this is the easiest one to read on this screen. 3.45 for the lower, upper infinity. I don't have infinity, so I'm just going to town on the nine button. Degree of freedom, five. When I do this, I end up getting a p-value of 63.1%. I have a really, really large p-value. If I have a large p-value, I'm going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, and I'm at my conclusion part of the problem. I had an issue with which way to shade. I now know which way to shade. I'm going to shade right. So I'm going to resume this style of thinking back on our four-step problem. Which way to shade? Well, I now know. that I'm always going to shade in the right direction. Ultimately, I'm testing if at least one thing is different. Previously, different meant either negative or positive. The downside here, or the plus side, is we've squared those things. So both the negative and the positives are going to square and only give me things going off to the positive side. So it's a one-tailed test and it's always a right tail. 
So my setup for my p-value is going to be chi squared CDF, the number, comma, infinity, comma, my degree of freedom. And in this case, I got something ridiculously large. I got 63.1%. That's bigger than pretty much any alpha you can reasonably choose. So I failed to reject the null hypothesis, which means in the context of the problem, I do not have evidence that the coin is unfair. So at first glance, it seemed like I wasn't getting nearly enough of those not, uh, ones, but I was getting way too many sixes. But when I look at the numbers in a bit more careful lens there, I'm really only off by like two or five in some of these categories. That can just be due to normal sample variation. So I'm not surprised when I see something like this, where I'm failing to reject the null hypothesis, because I have such a large p-value. It's easy to get lost in the details on this. So I want to do another problem from start to finish here, where I just figure out what's going on with this uh, testing a distribution. And for this problem, I actually went to Fred Meyer and I got a um, medium size of M&Ms. They're supposed to be sharing size, but I ate them all on my own there. Um, mild regrets, but that's okay. I got 78 blues, 47 browns, 57 greens, 83 orange, 58 red, and 43 yellow. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking, well, do each of these colors show up uniformly? In other words, do they all show up the same amount of times? So let's try to test this. My first step is going to be come up with the hypotheses. My second step is going to be model. And I'm noticing that I can count the number of, of these M&Ms. So this is countable data which means I'm going to be using chi-squared. Third step, I'm going to be looking at a p-value. And I already know what the setup of this is going to look like. It's always going to be a right-tailed test. So my picture is going to have some mound coming off to the right side. It's going to be whatever my chi-squared number is, comma infinity, comma degree of freedom, this will be some sort of a right tail test. Now, I don't know where this value is. I might have to fix my picture. This is just a super rough sketch. And finally, my fourth uh, step of this thing is my conclusion. This is just M&Ms. So I'm going to use a neutral alpha level of 5% again to see if I reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. OK. Um, before I get too far into the actual computational part of this, let's try to just figure out what am I working with for this bag of M&Ms. First thing I'm wondering is what do I have for the total number of uh, M&Ms and how many M&Ms should I have expected for each of the colors? Well, figuring out the total is not that bad. I'm just going to add all these things up. And I see that I consumed 366 M&Ms. This is actually going to be a fairly nice number because I noticed this is divisible by one, two, three, four, five, six categories, which will be nice. My null hypothesis is the proportion of red is equal to the proportion of yellow, is equal to the proportion all the way up to brown. I have six colors. I think these should all show up one sixth of the time. This is remarkably similar to that dye example that we just had, but our N is considerably larger here. Alternative hypothesis, at least one color is not a good fit. 
In other words, at least one color is going to be different than the one sixth being claimed. So if I'm trying to figure out how often each of these things should have shown up, I'm going to take the total number of candies, 366, and I'm going to split this up by one sixth for each of those categories. Now, just a note, if it was the case that orange was show, supposed to show up 20% and red was supposed to show up 10%, I would multiply the 366 by 20 here and 10 here. So I'm multiplying by whichever percentage I think for each of the individual colors. It doesn't have to be the same color every single time. We just have to be, uh, happen to be testing uniform for this problem. 366 split up six ways gives me an expected count of 61 for each of these categories. And some colors are really, really close to looking fair. Green looks close to fair, red looks close to fair. Some are not as close. So I have way more orange than I anticipated and yellow doesn't look that hot either. So let's try to figure out what's going on with the total of those relative errors essentially squared. So my chi squared, I'm going to be adding the observed values minus the expected. I'm going to square these so I don't get zero with everything canceling out. And I'm going to go down the list. So I'm going to have 78 is the first color that I saw was blue. And I was expecting to get 61 blues. Squaring that so I don't get zero, I was expecting to get 61 blues. Let's match up the next one, brown. I observed 47 brown, but I was expecting 61 brown squared so I don't get a negative. I was expecting 61 brown. I'm going to do this for green, 57 minus 61 squared over 61. I'm going to do this for orange. I'm going to do this all the way up to yellow, 43 minus 61 squared over 61. I'm going to type this into my calculator. And I don't know what this answer is. So I'm going to have to take my time to figure it out. And there's no way to rush this. I don't have a shortcut. I'm just taking my time and I'm typing this into my calculator. And sometimes I like that. I like problems where that force me to slow down a little bit to think about what I'm doing instead of being rush, rush, rush all the time. When I did this, I got a chi-squared of 21.61 or so. So let's put this on the curve. Zero is the smallest it can be. The mound is the degree of freedom minus two. Our degree of freedom for six colors is five. So my mound is happening at three. Mound is just there as a reference. I'm not using this three anywhere computationally. I'm just trying to figure out how far away this is. So if this is three and I'm counting by three, then really 21 should be somewhere like way, way the heck out there. I'm anticipating a ridiculously small p value. So I'll have chi squared CDF. My chi squared is 21.61. It goes forever in that infinity direction. My degree of freedom for this problem was five. I'm expecting zero plus, but I'm still going to type it into my calculator. And when I type this into my calculator, I got something like 6e minus 4. Reminder that scientific notation, that's like three zeros and then a 6. This is a pretty small p value. If my p value is low, my null must go. I'm rejecting the null hypothesis. I have evidence that at least one color 
is different than the uniform claim. All at once, this is kind of a nice conclusion, but a bit of a bummer of a conclusion too, because it doesn't tell me which colors are off. If I wanted to know which color was off, I would have to check each individual one and see what their percentages looked like. Now, the way that I end up doing this is something called a standardized residual. Here's what a standardized residual does. It takes the observed for the color, I subtract the expected for the color, and I look at the square root of the expected. So this is the square root of a single one of those entries. And this has kind of a value minus center over standard deviation field to it. And if that value minus center over standard deviation reminds you of a z-score, that's a great thing. This is effectively like a z-score for that color. So let's do this z-score like thing, the standardized residual, that's the technical name for it, for blue. So for blue, I saw 78, I expected 61, I expected 61, I'm typing that in and let's see what we get. When I do this, I end up getting 2.18 or so. And a reminder, unusual is anything more than two standard deviations away. So if I have anything bigger than positive two or less than negative two, I would say it's unusual. So even if it didn't look like it, I actually have an unusual number of blue candies there. I have way more than I was anticipating. I thought I should only have 61 blues, but I ended up with 78 blues. Let's find another one of these standardized residuals together, and then I'm gonna have you do a bunch on your own. Let's find it for yellow. Yellow looks like it might be unfair. So for yellow, my standardized residual, I saw 43, but I thought I should only get 61. So I'm way under what I was anticipating. I'm expecting a negative here for this value. Typing this into my calculator, I get negative 2.30. So the yellow, also unusual, but this is unusually low. I'm gonna ask that you pause the video and you go back to that top table, see if you can find all of these other residuals, how much air I have for each of them. And as you go through the problems, I will as well, just to see what I get for each of these colors. So go ahead and pause it, give it a go. Okay, if you're joining me again, for brown, I got negative 1.79. That's not unusual. That's pretty close to what I was anticipating. For this next one, green, green was really close, negative 0.51. That's usual. Green looked okay. So these looked okay. Blue and yellow looked like those could probably be unfair colors. Let's check out orange. Orange was monstrous at 83, woof. And that had a z-score of 2.82, that looks unfair. Red, red was really close. We had 58 and we thought we should get 61. So unsurprisingly, this also appears to be fair. So not only can I identify that the color distribution is not as claimed, it also tells me which colors look like they're off. Blue, orange, and yellow are all likely some value different than one sixth of the time.
I actually called Eminem as a follow-up to this, and I asked them how often each of the callers showed up. Their customer service is surprisingly nice, and I think they just get ans uh, asked this question all the time, because as soon as I started asking, they immediately started to tell me that blue shows up 24% of the time, brown shows up 13% of the time, green shows up 16% of the time, orange shows up 20% of the time, uh, red shows up 13% of the time, and yellow shows up 14% of the time. So let's test the color distribution that they're telling me here to see if this is more or less reasonable. So a couple things don't change. One thing that's not changing, I still have the 366 candies. It's still the same bag of candy. I still have six categories, which continues to give me a degree of freedom of five. But my null and alternative hypothesis are gonna look a little bit different. My null hypothesis for this is gonna be that blue shows up 24% of the time, that the probability of brown is 13% of the time, the probability of green is 16, orange is 20, red is 13. This makes me miss uniform or the all the same because I have to write them out. And yellow is 14. Now all it takes is one color for this whole thing to be off. So my alternative hypothesis is at least one color does not fit the distribution. I am testing the goodness of fit using a chi-squared model. I'm going to figure out how much I have for each of these expected. Let's start with this blue. Now, previously, I did the 366 times the 1 6 for each of those colors, but now I have to multiply them by their actual probabilities. For example, blue shows up 24% of the time, or at least that's what they tell me. When I do the multiplication, I end up getting 87.84. And if you're thinking, well, I can't have part of a candy, this has got to be 88. No. I leave it as a decimal. Sometimes I'll get more than 87, sometimes I'll get less. Think of this as an average expected value for that color. For brown, I'm doing three, three, uh, 366 times the point 0.13. I get 47.58 for brown. Blue is much closer. Brown previously, this was 47 compared to 61. Now with this new claim, it's 47 to 47. I'm feeling pretty good about this new distribution. Let's check green. I actually don't know the results to this thing yet. I love problems where I don't know the answers to them. There's a little bit of element of mystery to it. So I took that 16% times 366 to get that 58.56. For orange, I'm going to show my work for another one here. I'm doing 366, and my orange probability was 20%. So I'm just multiplying each of those unique percentages as I go. This is 73.2. I'm off by 10 candies, but I used to be off by something like 22. So I have considerably less air. Red. Red, I'm a little worried about because I used to be closer, uh, 58 compared to 61. This is now compared to 47.58. So I guess you win some, you lose some. Yellow, 51.24. That's closer as well. Man, I'm really interested. Okay. This is data that I can count. So for my model, I'm using chi-squared. 
I can count the data, uh, random selection of candy, one color does not affect another, and I expect five in each of those colors. So my assumptions are met. I am going to look at the observed for blue, 78, minus the expected for blue, 87.84. I'm gonna square it, divided by the expected for blue, observed minus expected squared over expected for blue. I'm going to do the same thing for brown. My standardized residual for brown is probably going to be really small considering how close this is. Observed minus expected over expected. That was for brown. Keep going. If you're doing this at home and you're watching this video, pause it. Type this into your calculator. Let's see what we get for our chi-squared. Last time our chi-squared was 21.61. I think this is probably gonna be a better fit, so that means I'm expecting a chi-squared to be smaller than that. It's not gonna be perfect. This still might end up being an unfair distribution. That nice woman at the M&M company might have liked to me, but I expect it's probably gonna be closer. And I'm just typing each of these in value minus center squared over that expected. It's easier when all the expecteds are the same. You have to be a little bit more intentional here where the numbers don't match up perfectly. If you can check me, that would be great. I got 6.07 as my chi-squared. I went from 21 down to six. This is way closer. I might end up failing to reject the null hypothesis this time around. I don't know. But I'm excited to figure it out. The smallest my error can be is zero. My mound is happening at the degree of freedom minus two, so my mound is still at three. And this time my chi-squared value is coming in around six or so. And I'm gonna shade this thing to the right because it's always a right tail test. My p-value is gonna be chi-squared CDF, starts at six, goes to infinity. My df is five, the number of categories minus one. So doing chi-squared CDF, nice. I get a p-value of 0 0.299. So when I'm at my fourth step, my conclusion, my p-value is now bigger than my alpha. If I have a large p-value, I failed to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, I do not have evidence that the M&M color distribution is different than claimed. So I currently have no reason to believe that M&M is lying to me when they gave me this color distribution. My tr uh, trust is restored in humanity there. I wanna find some of these standard residuals with you just to see how some of these things will have changed. Um, one of them that might be of interest is orange because orange was so different the time before I'm only going to do one of these, but I would encourage you to go back and do them all. Orange, I'm taking my observed minus the expected. For the residual, this is pretty much the same thing as before, but instead of squaring, 
I'm actually looking at the square root of the entry. I'm typing this into a calculator and I'm going to see what I get. One point one five. Nice. My residual or disease score used to be something like two point eight. That was more than two away and was unusual. Now with this new color distribution that they're telling me, I'm getting one point one five and things are looking pretty fair. So the six point zero seven for that chi squared, that actually wasn't that large. However, a chi-squared of something like 21.61 was big enough for me to have a total amount of error that caused things to be unfair. So at some point, I'm going to have a chi-squared that I'm going to consider to be large instead of small. I'm going to have essentially a critical value for chi-squared, where if anything is bigger than that, I'll reject. And if anything is smaller than that, I will fail to reject. I can find this inside of your D2L shell. So let me get inside of D2L. I'm going to share my screen with you. I'm in D2L. I am going into content. I'm going to look up a table. Chi-squared table. Here's how this thing works. I find my degree of freedom in whatever alpha level I would like to use. For example, I like to use an alpha level of 5%. So I'm going to find where the 5% meets my degree of freedom of 5. This thing is a grid. And it looks like that number ends up being 11.07. I'm going to return to sharing my overhead with you. Great. So when I found the degree of freedom where this thing met up with my given alpha level, this will give me a critical value for my chi-squared. This is just another way of coming up with a conclusion. If you notice that your chi-squared for your test is larger than this critical value, this chi-squared star, then you will reject the null hypothesis. An example of this, when I did that first test, I had a chi-squared of 21.61. This is bigger than this 11.07 number, that's why I rejected the null hypothesis. In contrast, if you have a chi-squared that is smaller or equal to that chi-squared, you would fail to reject the null hypothesis. For example, when we did this with this new color distribution, I ended up getting a chi-squared of 6. That 6 was small compared to this critical value of 11.07. So when I talk about small or large chi-squareds, I'm comparing that to this chi-squared star, this critical value. This will help me determine if I should be rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. Now, just a note, in practice, I almost never use this thing. I often just come up with the p-value and I look it up. But I want to hit you with this terminology because people in the industry still kind of use this. So if you hear this chi-squared star and you're thinking, well, what the heck is that? Just think of it as a line in the sand for how we determine what fair and not fair means. And when you hear that, you can respond by saying, OK, well, I actually got a p-value of blank. And for me, a p-value is way more descriptive than one line that's drawn in the sand that I have to recalculate each time, depending on these different alpha levels. So we just compared multiple counts and distributions here at the same time, which I think is completely fascinating. But we only did this for one type of M&M. So I just have nothing but regular M&Ms that I tested here. 
I'm curious if I can do a grid of these things, if I can compare the colors for regular M&Ms to peanut M&Ms and see if there's a difference between the two. It feels like I can. It feels like I'm really close to doing that already. But in lesson 11, I'm going to take that one step further and see what that math actually looks like. So this will be one of two days spent looking at this chi-squared uh, chi distribution where I'm comparing counts. And I look forward to doing more math with you next time.